The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome. My name's Charles Christian and you're listening to another episode of the Weird Tales radio show. What have we got for you today? Well, loads of stuff. But before we go any further, here's a little interesting piece I spotted in uh, the latest Fortean Times. And it raises the question of whether aliens are already among us and have been for millions of years. Uh, There's a paper uh, out, a scientific paper, in the Journal of Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology, which is on the subject of cause of Cambrian explosion, terrestrial or cosmic. And it looks at the fact that in the Cambrian era, there was a huge burst of new creatures and new life evolving on Earth. And the scientists are looking at where all this sudden burst of enthusiasm for evolution came from. And one of the ideas they have is that perhaps Earth was bombarded by organic molecules from outer space. Uh, Perhaps some cataclysm out there in outer space and the question is did the impetus for all the evolution come from there so uh, there were extraterrestrial beings Uh, they're particularly interested in the octopus which they say it's uh, shows a staggering level of complexity with 33,000 protein coding genes, more than is present in us lot, Homo sapiens, has a large brain, sophisticated nervous system, camera-like eyes, flexible body, instantaneous camouflage via the ability to switch colour and shape. And uh, it says these are striking features to appear suddenly in the evolutionary scene. So was it just a freak that it developed this or was it the result of an extraterrestrial import? Perhaps um, some form of cryopreserved genes, even fertilised octopus eggs, arrived uh, several hundred million years ago uh, in a cosmic cloud that bombarded the Earth. So um, there you go. Don't go looking for aliens, they're already in the sea with us. Okay, on with the show. Well, the weather's getting better. Time to go out on those ghost hunts because you're not going to freeze to death in the cold. However, we've got a fairly major league urban myth discussed for anybody planning going ghost hunting in the Norfolk Broads area, which is the Norfolk-Suffolk area of East Anglia, uh, all the waterways round there and a popular holiday-making centre. That last little piece is obviously for our non-UK readers. Now, one of the things we have here on Weird Tales Radio is we regularly monitor reports of hauntings so we can say you know the 2nd of april is the anniversary of a regular haunting at a certain location when the ghost of whoever is seen and uh, i was looking through the various databases and i came across a report that the 2nd of april was the anniversary of um, an annual uh, manifestation of a crew of Vikings blowing horns and cracking whips, making their way around the village of Ludham on the Norfolk Broads. And then um, five days later, on the 7th of April, we have the ghost of Acle Bridge, A-C-L-E, 
and uh, that was supposedly a ghost of a murder victim hunting for his murderer. And I thought, well, those ring a bell, um, because I'd recently bought in a charity shop a copy of Ghosts of the Broads by uh, Charles Simpson. That's Norfolk Broads, not broads as in women and just like to clarify that and uh, this is a uh, pretty much mid condition copy edition of the uh, book produced by local publishers printers Gerald and Son in Norwich in 1976 and I read the stories and I thought people do know these stories are fiction don't they uh, the author's very clever. He's taken some well-known ghost stories or legends and uh, dramatised them. And he's put in plenty of quotations by supposed witnesses. And he quotes a whole raft of very uh, distinguished-sounding uh, reference books. Reportatorium, Ecclesiastim, uh, the, Country, the Gentleman's Gazette, County pastorals, notitia dignitatum, lots of stuff like that that sound very impressive. Um, but is it real? Is it dramatised? Or is it a hoax? Now, uh, digging in through the archives, I found a copy of a newsletter from spring 1982. It's a copy of a publication called Lantern, and it was produced by the BSIG, which stands for the Borderline Science Investigation Group. And um, the first story is, it's strange how things seem to move in circles. Ten years ago, when BSIG was first formed, the group gave a lot of attention to a book entitled Ghosts of the Broads by Charles Sampson. In fact, for a time, it was almost the sole reference book on local ghosts that the group consulted. In fact, BSIG members spent many long and futile hours waiting in cold, dark and uncomfortable locations, hoping to see at least one of the apparitions mentioned in the book's pages. As time passed, members of the BSIG became increasingly aware that all was not as it seemed in this book, and even went as far as discovering that some of the stories recorded therein were much closer to fiction than fact. But, perhaps because the members of the BSIG did not want to admit it, that they had been misled, no real research was ever carried out into the stories. Finally, this situation has now been well and truly rectified, where one of our members has spent 18 months researching into the stories, and he publishes uh, in this particular newsletter. And uh, it's called Hoax of the Broads, an investigation by Mike Burgess. And it basically runs through the stories that feature in Ghosts of the Broads. Uh, this is the 1973 and 1976 editions. And comes to the conclusion that 90% of the book is sheer fiction in uppercase. And goes on to say that uh, some of the stories are just loosely based around existing legends. Some are totally fantasy. And also dwells on the fact that so many of the references, the eyewitnesses etc. And these include lords, knights, scientists, clergy, military, JPs and professional people. And not a single one of these people ever existed. And it also goes on to discuss the various books in the bibliography. And once again, most of these never existed. So what exactly happened? What is the story behind Charles Sampson, who apparently spent 25 years of his life cruising during his holidays around the Norfolk Broads, collecting these ghost stories and, in some instances, encountering them. Um, he was a surgeon and a, later became a Harley Street physician and, um, along with Ghosts of the Broads, the only other books he's ever published include 
books about sailing on his motor yacht and books about uh, medical science. He also apparently uh, invented some form of marine signalling apparatus, which he was granted a patent for. And he died in 1940 at the age of 59. So what's the story? Well, this is basically what happened. The book began as a series of stories published in the Yachtsman magazine. And they were later compiled into a book published by Yachtsman Publishing. And I think it was actually sponsored by Herbert Woods. Uh, Certainly they still have, still quote the stories in Ghosts of the Broads in their own literature. And essentially they were a series of ripping yarns for people who were sailing round the broads on their holidays so that they could say, Ooh, tonight we're mooring by St Bennet's Abbey where it is said you can hear the screams of the treacherous prior who was hanged from the gateway of his own priory for letting the Normans in and betraying the Saxons. And plenty of other ones. And you can imagine when you're sitting in a boat in the 1930s with some little hurricane lamp for illumination and you're all huddled around your little fire and having a hot toddy. It will be very atmospheric and spooky and um, rather jolly. Uh, Unfortunately, time got in the way. And uh, when it came around to the republication of the stories in 1973. It was reprinted by Gerald and it was given a fresh preface. And um, Richard Sutton of Pullham Market says, um, it's many years since I was given an original copy of this book and I've always been fascinated by it and I'm always looking for a way to republish it. And I've done lots of research, and this is what I can tell you about Dr. Charles Sampson, the Harley Street physician, and uh, all his work. And it sounds very, very, very plausible, as if this is a new edition of a genuine ghost hunting book. But somewhere along the way in the editing, it's been lost the fact that no... These aren't real case studies of ghosts. This is a pure fiction from beginning to end. Yes, he might have picked on an occasional story that we've heard of before and that there is some possibility that this is a well-known ghost story, but most of them are made up. Indeed, when you read through these stories, you find that uh, Charles Sampson has a, a bit of an obsession for black skeletons with fiery eyes rushing into buildings and dragging away wrongdoers for eternal damnation. They crop up on a number of occasions. And, um, you know, you just have to look through them and you think, that's just been made up, hasn't it? Uh, Take this next piece here. There's a character who's quoted as a Uh, witness to a haunting and he says well when good king james was king you know the one i mean the son of william the conqueror and father of pope joan ah well there was a very wicked man who lived near here in a big house where them trees are now and it's been haunted too well you know it, it should really flag up that maybe that's not all right so this is a good example it's the haunting at potter hayam again on the broads and supposedly uh, he goes and see two men have seen this ghost in recent years one's hair went snow white overnight while the other man's hair completely fell out and it gives names of the people who supposedly were struck bald or went white and uh, it talks about uh, a lady Carew who consulted a witch who uh, concocted a spell so that Lady Carew's daughter would be able to make a good marriage. Lady Evelyn would be able to make a very good marriage. And, it, you know, it, it carries out all the details there. Um, on the 31st of May, 1741, they were married by special license in Norwich Cathedral by the Lord Abbot of St. Bennet at Home and Norwich. And... Um, goes on to say they then went on to uh, their stately home 
where they held a feast. But on the stroke of midnight, the outer gates were flung open, and the bishop's coach arrived with his lordship robed in mitre. Large front doors of the hall were rolled back. The bishop mounted the steps. And then, suddenly, the bishop and his attendants changed into skeletons. Ah, the entire gathering fell back in horror. The skeleton seized the beautiful bride and raised her kicking and screaming in his arms and raced out of the hall, leaving behind a dense cloud of sulphurous smoke, jumped onto the box of the coach and galloped away. Ah, they tore towards Hayam Bridge. Ah, the people who happened to be about there saw the luminous coach dash past, its wheels glowing with phosphorescence, driven madly by a skeleton who appeared to be on fire inside. Um, as I've said, Charles Sampson does like his flaming skeletons, and clothed in the outfit of a bishop. Ah, uh, their coach swayed from side to side, but when it came to the bridge, it swayed so violently it stuck the stonework and crashed into the river, the river Thurn beneath, in flames. And that was the last anybody saw of the fair Lady Evelyn. She had paid the price she had promised. She'd given her soul to the devil. And then it supposedly happens every year. And you would have thought there might just be someone who, since 1741, had given a reliable account of it. But there you go. So, Ghosts of the Broads. It's a ripping yarn. It's a good read. It's enjoyable. Still in print. But... It is not a ghost hunter's manual. It is not a case book. Uh, so any would-be ghost hunters out there, tiptoe slightly on. And by way of a footnote to our story on the uh, Norfolk Broads ghost hoax, and we made reference to the Borderline Scientific Science Investigation Group, BSIG, found a bit more information about them. Um, they operated from 1971 until sometime round about 1982-83. Um, they do seem to have more or less fallen apart after the discovery that the book they'd been using as their ghost hunting bible was a fake. Uh, they did produce a quarterly magazine called The Lantern, and that is now available online as a PDF archive uh, on the Hidden East Anglia site. That's uh, www.hiddenea.com. Very useful site, um, particularly in terms of uh, mystic stones and things of that nature and uh, landscape uh, mythology. Anyway, you can find them all there. They're uh, quite crudely produced because this was in the era pre-word processors, desktop publishing and the likes, and I think they've been typed and produced manually on uh, duplicators. Anyway, they are all there, 40 issues of the publication, and interestingly, they do have quite a lot of stories about UFO sightings, some of them going way back to 1973, whereas we tend to think that uh, UFOs in East Anglia began and ended in 1980 with the Rendlesham sighting. And that's it. Something Wicked This Way Comes. Weird Harvest Press presents Harvest Hymns, the sweet fruits and twisted roots of folk horror. A two-volume set of books investigating the music of folk horror, featuring contributions from some of the biggest names in the field. Candia McCormack, Johnny Trunk, Maddie Pryor, Sharon Krause, Jim Jupp, and Kemper Norton, to name just a few. Available now via lulu.com. 100% of all weird Harvest Press profits are donated to wildlife charities. Welcome, fool. You have come of your own free will to the appointed place. It is time to keep your appointment with the Wicker Man. The wicker man. 
Here's another witchcraft story. And this is set in the Middle Ages and it is supposedly factual. And it involves the Witch of Berkeley, or if you're American, Berkeley. And it relates to the Church of St. Mary in Berkeley in Gloucestershire. There was a witch in the area called Alison. Uh, she had three children, a son, two sons, an older son, a younger son and a daughter. The daughter, who was a nun, uh, described her in the following terms. My mother is a witch and a sorceress, a woman accustomed to wickedness and to the practice of ancient methods of augury and soothsaying, who has indulged her sinful appetites all her life. The story starts off when the son, who was a monk, was having dinner, which in the medieval times was what we'd now call lunchtime, was uh, having lunch with his mother. And he writes, I was dining with my mother, Alison, and then a little crow, which she kept as a pet, uttered a sound that sounded like human speech. Yes, you're thinking, was that crow her familiar? Could well have been. This startled my mother so much that she dropped her knife. Groaning sorrowfully, her face grown sudden pale, she said, Today my plough has turned its final furrow. I am about to hear and undergrow great sorrow. And uh, moments later, a messenger arrived with news that the eldest son had died. The mother then said, My child, I have enslaved myself to the artifice of the devil and have been the mistress of forbidden things. But despite my evil doings, I have always been accustomed to the hope that my miserable soul might be eased in the end by the comforts of your religion. In my desperate straits, I have always thought of you and your sister as my champions against demons and my guardians against a most savage enemy, as in the devil. Now, as I end my life, I am likely to face the prospect of being tortured and punished by those very beings who used to be my advisers in sin. I implore you, who I brought into the world and suckled, to do all you can from faith and pity to alleviate my coming torment, though I do not expect that you can deflect true judgment from my soul. The son then went on to say that his mother requested that when she died, her body be sewn up in a shroud of deer hide and then placed face upwards in a stone sarcophagus, the lid sealed with lead and iron, and then went on to say that the sarcophagus should be bound with three heavy iron chains and that fifty psalms should be sung each night and masses said each night to lessen the ferocious attacks of her enemies. And it goes on to say... Her final wish was, when I have lain secure in this way for three nights, bury me on the fourth day. Although so grave are my sins, I fear the earth itself might refuse to receive me to its warming bosom. So anyway, you get the general idea. So the first night, well, the first night, it went all right. The choir kept vigil, they sang psalms, uh, said prayers around it. And nothing happened. Nothing disturbed the night. The second night, however, was different. Around about matins, which in medieval times would have been said about 2am in the morning, from outside the church could be heard a chittering and chirping, as if a legion of giant insects had encircled the church. Then came the sound of talons scratching and pulling at the edges of the door, and of a deep voice, like that of an enormous toad, croaking out, Alison, rise up and join us. And from the depths of the chain sarcophagus, the voice of the old woman could be heard replying, I cannot, because I am chained in this prison of stone. The attacks on the door resumed, and, uh, Splints and cracks began to appear in the wooden planking, but it held strong. And as dawn came up, what the priests inside assumed were the armies of Satan disappeared. And now we come to the final night. This was the third night. 
this was rather different because in the early hours of the morning, a giant demon, far taller than any of the other demons that had been seen before, rode up to the church on a large black stallion and the demon smashed open the doors, splintering them as if they were made of matchwood, not solid oak. It then went in, ripped the top off the sarcophagus, snapping the three chains, and dragged the old woman, the witch, behind him and went back outside. The demon then threw the woman over the horse, and um, it should be noted that this black stallion had what appeared to be long iron spikes and barbs protruding from the length of its back. So the demon threw the woman over the horse, impaling her upon several of these cruel hooks. And the demon climbed on his horse and galloped away into the early morning light. As the horse disappeared, it said that the cries of the old woman could be heard fading into the distance. And that, my friends, is the sad story of the Witch of Barclay. If you want to grow your business, save time using the latest tech, and look great online, Weird Appeal Digital can help. We have a free, yes, that's free, download listing 40 digital tools, apps, and resources to help you grow your brand, promote your project, generate leads, and reach your audience. Just go to www appeal.digital slash weird tales for smart effective digital design and your free download go to www.appeal.digital slash weird tales and that's it we're out of time again thank you very much for joining us we hope you'll join us again next time and uh, before i say good night one little final story I spotted in the latest issue of The Author. That's the magazine of the UK Society of Authors. And the London Library, uh, which used to be a uh, subscriber-only lending library in St. James Square in London, uh, one of its members back in the day, uh, between 1890 and 1897, was Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula. And uh, the current development director of the library, a certain Philip Spedding, has been going through the catalogue and has located 26 of the books mentioned in Stoker's research notebooks. Those are the research he did for uh, the novel Dracula. Uh, they include Sabine, Bearing Goals, The Book of Werewolves, and a remarkably cheery sounding Roundabout the Carpathians by an A.F. Cross. Uh, an examination of the books showed detailed markings that closely match references in the author's notes of the novel, which is a uh, polite way of saying when he was borrowing the books, he was writing notes in the margins, naughty man, and uh, then incorporating them in his novel. Hmm. Not really sure what to say about that. Anyway, once again, thank you for joining us. Stay well, stay weird, stay different. Good night. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. You can keep in touch with us online at www.weirdtalesradio.com by email to weirdtales at icloud.com and on Twitter at Urban Fantasist. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Good night. <laughs>